time for another book review. And the book that we're looking at today is The Hunchback of Notre Dame, sometimes called Notre Dame of Paris by Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo is, of course, one of the most renowned French novelists ever. He's best known for Les Miserables, but uh, I've always been more curious about Hunchback of Notre Dame, partially because I just loved the Disney movie growing up. And this year I found it at Valley Village for $2, so I decided it was finally time to read it, and I'm so glad I did because this turned out to be the best thing I have read all year so far. The story takes place at the end of the Middle Ages in Paris, around the 1400s. It starts off with the Festival of Fools, where you get this big panoramic introduction to the rabble of Paris and all the little social tensions that are at play. There's also this mystery surrounding Notre Dame Cathedral that you get introduced to, where there's like this weird bell ringer Quasimodo, and you get sort of drafts of the rumors surrounding him. But unlike the Disney version or other adaptations, the story does not center on Quasimodo. You're kind of left to sort of speculate about him, just like the rest of the crowd does. Uh, instead, the book sort of introduces you to a whole host of other characters. There's um, Gringoire, who is this down-on-his-luck playwright. There's Troy Le Fou and Jean Frollo, who are both these, like, trickster types. And, of course, the book centers on a love triangle as well between Esmeralda, who is a Romani woman, a soldier named Phoebus, and a priest named Frollo, who turns out to be a really engaging villain. He becomes obsessed with Esmeralda, and throughout the book he has all these horrific machinations of how to entrap this woman and blackmail her and basically claim her as his own. Esmeralda and Quasimodo are frequently paralleled throughout the book. They're both extremely marginalized people, Esmeralda for her race and class, and Quasimodo for his deformities. While the author is great at getting you to feel sorry for them and root for them, they're not just there to be pitied. Esmeralda is in a lot of sort of damsel in distress situations, but she's not a shrinking flower by any means. Esmeralda has been hardened by life on the streets, and she's kind of a badass for it. At the same time, though, uh, Hugo makes sure that you know that she's a 16-year-old girl, so she kind of acts like it. Uh, she's a little bit naive, and she's a little bit vain, especially when it comes to love. She falls hopelessly in love with Phoebus, and, you know, you come to understand why, because he's a guy with rank and status, and he shows her respect and a willingness to protect her, so it makes sense, given what you know about her life, that she would just fall hook, line, and sinker for him. And then there's also this virginity as virtue thing with Esmeralda, which I realize is a little bit dated, but um, I think it kind of translates well here because, sure, you can look at it as, oh, she's being ranked on her virginity or whatever, but you could also look at it as, well, she just wants to defend herself. She has these principles and she's sticking to them, and so she has a lot of agency. So I think her character works really well in this book. And then you have Quasimodo, who, like I said earlier, is held out of sight for most of the story. And while I sort of was disappointed at that at first, I grew to really find it uh, effective, because all this speculation sort of builds on you and all these expectations, and then when you finally get the payoff, you're kind of comparing what you've been told about Quasimodo to who he actually is. But aside from those two characters, you've got an incredible villain in Frollo, and you have a cast of thousands that are all a lot of fun to engage with. Like, I love Frollo's bum of a younger brother, for example. So yeah, like, the character writing in this is really excellent. As the characters' lives intertwine, the story evolves into this panoramic Machiavellian drama that also has a lot of humor and social commentary and satire in it. Hugo is a great writer. There's a lot of atmosphere. It's just a very immersive read all the way through. And by the end of it, you feel like there's hardly a thread that's out of place. Some chapters start off in a way that you think it's some kind of non sequitur, but as information is given to you, you slowly realize just what you're being told and why it's relevant to the plot. It's, it's really effective. And the other thing is that Hugo is a master of weaving between different tones without giving you whiplash. 
the book shifts constantly between being a comedy and a tragedy, so you're always left wondering what's going to happen next. The only problem I have, I guess, is that there's a lot of very heavy-handed foreshadowing. And, you know, I think Hugo wants you to come to conclusions way before the rest of the characters do, so he's trying to use dramatic irony, like, as a major motif, because miscommunications and things like that are a big theme in this book. So, um, the other thing is that, you know, this is a romanticist novel, so you can expect quite a bit of melodrama and coincidence and things like that, but, you know, it's kind of a given for a novel like this, so it didn't bother me that much. And all of those things are so easy to forgive when you consider just how suspenseful the story becomes as all these things slowly weave together and the stakes get raised and it gets more and more intense. Like, the climax of this book is hands down the best I've read all year, and I would be shocked if I found a better ending to a book that I read in 2023. Like, I was just on the edge of my seat and emotionally exhausted by the time this book finished. I should warn you, though, that this book has some sections that some people might find a bit boring. So, the book is very slow to start. It took me over 50 pages before I started to connect with it. And that's because the start is just omniscient perspective bouncing all around between just an avalanche of names and all this info that's being thrown at you. Although it's hard to get a foothold in that part, it's also a great way at introducing you to the rabble of Paris and all these social tensions that are churning just below the surface. Then there's these non-narrative sections, and while they seem to bog the story down, admittedly, um, you learn a lot through them, like there's a part about the history of Paris, or the architecture of Notre Dame, and even aside from just taking them at face value, there's a lot of deeper themes that are being hinted at even in these chapters. Basically what I'm saying is even the parts that seem a little weird, they have a purpose. The one that bothered me the most, though, was uh, right in the middle of the climax, you cut away to a scene that could have been summarized in a couple of sentences, but instead you get this protracted part where it's just obviously poking fun at the citizen king Louis Philippe that Hugo was living under. So he's like laser focusing his commentary on a Parisian audience of the 1830s, and those parts are a little bit harder to digest. Um, yeah, so some of these diversions, even though I like them for the information and the thematic purposes, um, they do tend to go on a little bit too long, so just be prepared for that when you go into this book. It's also worth keeping in mind just how much was happening in France around the time that Hugo published this book. He had lived through insane amounts of social upheaval and political upheaval, the French Revolution, the rise of Napoleon and the Napoleonic Wars, the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy. So he, there was a lot to say, and he uses this book a lot and the time setting of the 1400s to comment on his own time. There's chapters that explicitly reference revolution, like the ongoing tension between the three estates in this book. So there's a lot to pick at when it comes to historical context here. But at the same time, I don't want to scare anyone off and make them think that they won't be able to understand this book. Like, you can go into this book completely blind and you'll still fall in love with the characters and the story and all that. I'm just saying that if you know some background about French history around this period, um, it will definitely enhance your enjoyment of the book and make you understand what Hugo was trying to do and say with this novel. But anyway, most of the themes in this book are very easy to connect with for a modern audience, so I really believe this is the kind of novel that has something for everybody. Please don't be intimidated, and if you see it in a store, pick it up and check it out because you won't regret it. Aside from a few issues I had with pacing, this book was just absolutely excellent. I give it an 8.5 out of 10, which, once again, makes it the best thing I've read all year. Um, yeah, so I guess we've come to the end of another review. Thank you for watching. If you have happened to read this, I'd love to hear from you because I could talk about this book for way more than I did in this video. 
and you know I'm considering reading a bunch more French novels this year so hopefully this is the beginning of a rich new vein of literature for me to tap into but uh yeah I guess I'm going now so in the words of the great people of Paris adios for now <laughs>